Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have uh, you all this morning. And part of what the IAS uh, does at these conferences is award excellence. And so we're going to start today with some prizes. And I want to tell you about the Cypher Grant Program, which awards two-year research grants of up to $150,000 to early stage researchers for projects that address priority research gaps in pediatric and adolescent HIV in resource-limited settings. This year, the new Cypher WHO Global Research Agendas in Pediatric and Adolescent HIV were used to update the eligible research topics. The research agendas were developed through a, gl a global process, gathering input from stakeholders worldwide, and they reflect the need for more operational and implementation science. Thanks to the continued support of Vive Healthcare, Cypher founding sponsor, and to Janssen, it is with great pleasure that I award the following outstanding research projects in adolescent HIV. And the first award goes to, sorry, there are the objectives uh, of the award. And the first award goes to Alain Amstutz, whose work will test several innovative targeted interventions along the HIV care cascade for adolescents and young people and assess their potential effectiveness to reach the 1990-90 UNAIDS targets in Lesotho. It's my pleasure, Alain. The second award I'm pleased to announce goes to Millicent Atajuna, whose work will investigate the link between poverty and art adherence and identify strategies to improve adherence and retention in care amongst youth in South Africa. Millicent. Third, Sarinya Tiranachai, whose project will evaluate approaches to improve the treatment cascade in youth in Thailand with the dual objective of improving individual health status and limiting HIV transmission among Thai youth. Sarinya. And finally, in this round, uh, my pleasure again to award Ilona Tosca, whose work will evaluate different healthcare provision models to improve HIV related outcomes among adolescent mothers living with HIV and their children in South Africa. Ilona. The Center for Infectious Disease Epidemiology and Research, or CIDA, at the University of Cape Town School of Public Health, in partnership with the Collaborative Initiative for Pediatric HIV Education and Research, uh, or CIFA, launched earlier this year a call for applications for a 15-month postdoctoral research fellowship to conduct research, including a systematic review of the literature on HIV-exposed, uninfected, or HEU, child health outcomes. This opportunity is part of CIFA Global Cohort Collaboration, which brings together the largest collaboration of pediatric and adolescent HIV observational cohort networks to date to answer key questions of global public health impact that cannot be answered by one network alone. I'm very happy in this uh, notion to award Barbara Berman, who has been selected for this 15-month fellowship. 
Barbara. As we continue to nurture our Cypher alumni, many of whom are presenting research at this very conference, we are pleased to announce the launch of a new round of grants with a special focus this year on operational science in pediatric HIV. Applications for this will open in October 2018. CIFO launched its Growing the Leaders of Tomorrow Fellowship Program in 2017 to build and support clinical research leadership in pediatric and adolescent HIV in low- and middle-income countries, particularly high-burden countries in sub-Saharan Africa. CIFO Fellows are medical practitioners from sub-Saharan Africa with clinical research experience and the potential to become the next generation of leaders in pediatric and adolescent HIV clinical science. Each fellow receives $70,000 over two years and has already linked with a potential mentor. The mentor is an internationally re renowned uh, researcher in pediatric and adolescent HIV with an established clinical research collaboration based at an institute of excellence in sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm sure you'll agree with me, these are some fantastic initiatives to make sure that we really are bridging the next generation to take pediatric and adolescent care forward. So it is my pleasure now to thank very much uh, the support of Vive Healthcare uh, and together with Janssen. Uh, and it is with my pleasure that I now announce a new launch uh, of this program and applications for this will open in November 2018. Thank you. To introduce our first plenary speaker, please welcome to the stage Professor Francoise Barry-Sunoussi. Francoise Barry-Sunoussi has been involved in retrovirology research since the early 1970s and has been recognized for her contributions to HIV AIDS research, in particular, the discovery of HIV in 1983. Until 2015, as research director at the National Institute for Health and Medical Research, INSERM, and professor at the Institut Pasteur in France, she led research programs on HIV AIDS pathogenesis, specifically on mechanisms required to control HIV SIV infection and or harmful T cell activation induced in response to HIV SIV infection. She serves as Honorary President of the Institut Pasteur International Network and of the Vi Virology Department of the Institut Pasteur in Paris. She was elected President of the IAS between 2012 and 2014 and is still Member and Chair of a number of international scientific advisory panels and boards. She also received more than 40 national and international awards and honors, including the 2008 Nobel Prize in Medicine for her contributions to HIV and AIDS. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, chair this uh, session on uh, breaking barriers and building bridges between our responses toward universal health. It's uh, really uh, a pleasure for me to see that uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, a session, in a plenary session on this topic, uh, since I'm personally convinced, uh, since already several years, that uh, it's time really to make the bridges between HIV 
and other disease. And it did the first uh, presentation uh, that we will have during this plenary session is uh, on that topic, understanding the intersecting uh, syndemics of communicable and non-communicable uh, disease, uh, which is a very, very important topic, as you know, um, on long-term treatment, some patients are developing comorbidities, uh, non ex comorbidities, and it's clear to me that even also for the development of HIV cure, for example, last year uh, during uh, the IAS conference in Paris, we organized as a, a pre-conference symposium, uh, a, 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 a symposium on the link between HIV persistence and cancer. So I'm very, very pleased to, uh, to call now the first speaker. The first speaker is Emily Heil. She's a, a, a clinician investigator in the Division of Infectious Disease at the Massachusetts General Hospital, an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She attended the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and completed uh, uh, a clinical uh, training and chief uh, residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital with additional training in epidemiology at the Harvard uh, Shan School of Public Health. As a member of the cost effectiveness of preventing AIDS complication research team, her research focuses on using stimulation modeling and cost effectiveness of analysis to investigate clinical and public health intervention for people with HIV. Funded by the National Institute of Health, Emily has led and contributed to model-based analysis that include studies on HIV and non-communicable comorbidities, HIV drug resistance, laboratory monitoring, point of care testing, and loss to follow up. Her research is seated in the U.S. Department for Health and Human Services guidelines for uh, the use of antiretroviral agents in HIV-infected adults and adolescents, as well as uh, the World AIDS Organization Consolidated Guideline on the Use of Antiretroviral Drug to, for Treating and Preventing HIV Infection. She was a member of the Guideline Development Group for the WHO Public Health Response to HIV to HIV Drug Resistance and has been invited speaker at the NIH and WHO on issues regarding resources, utilization, and cost effectiveness. As a practitioning physician, she provides clinical care for people with HIV and other infectious disease. Please, Emily. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. Let me get all my bearings. So. HIV and TB are synergistic. An infection with one hastens the progression of the other among those who are co-infected. And this interaction is incredibly well known to all of us. There's an additional impact of diabetes. HIV infection and antiretroviral therapy have been associated with the development of impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes. And diabetes is a well-described risk factor for TB. Better outcomes for each one are achieved if the others are prevented or at least optimally treated. And there's an additional influence of structural barriers to care, including economic instability, food insecurity, marginalized housing or homelessness, racism, discrimination, violence, stigma, among many others. Because of the impact of these structural barriers on access to prevention, diagnosis, and care, the already synergistic disease processes of HIV, diabetes, and tuberculosis are worsened still further. And this is the syndemics framework first proposed in the mid-90s. This framework endorses the health conditions co-occur due to adverse social conditions and interact synergistically, resulting in worse outcomes than just the sum of the parts. The syndemics framework encourages a broader view of the challenges contributed to multimorbidity and includes social, behavioral, and biologic interactions. Given this syndemics framework, I'm going to review some of the ongoing challenges and successes of global HIV treatment scale-up, 
with a focus on how we can leverage the lessons of HIV as a chronic disease. I'll then turn to the important question of how HIV coexists with a wide range of other health-related issues globally. And finally, return to the Syndemics framework to show how it suggests opportunities to maximize the impact of interventions directed towards HIV and other health-related issues faced by people with HIV. The global fight against HIV AIDS is far from over. As we have heard over the course of this conference, almost a million people are still dying from HIV AIDS annually, and new HIV infections are too frequent. HIV incidence is rising in 50 countries. This is unacceptable in 2016 when we have effective prevention and treatment that must be available to all. Incredible progress has been made to help people with HIV access the treatment that they need and deserve, with reports of now 22 million people taking ART worldwide, which is almost 60% of everyone we need to reach. These data are well known to us all and demonstrate the remarkable scale-up of HIV diagnosis and treatment in terms of outreach for testing, access to treatment, and the efficacy of antiretroviral therapy. These achievements are all the more remarkable given the structural barriers and syndemic risk factors that present challenges. However, this cascade also highlights how much work still needs to be done for all people with HIV worldwide to learn their status and access life-saving, effective treatment. As many presenters and speakers have emphasized already this week, breaking down barriers and building bridges are a major priority. Those with access to ART can expect to live a normal lifespan. Data from the US, Canada, and Europe supports that a 20-year-old person with HIV who achieves a CD4 count greater than 350 within a year of starting ART can expect to live to a year of age of 78. In South Africa, the difference in life expectancies between people with HIV and the HIV uninfected have shrunk markedly over the past 10 years to 1.2 years for men and a difference of 5.3 years for women. Still too great a difference, but much improved, and mostly due to the decreases in deaths from HIV or TB. As people with HIV live longer and grow older, we can expect that they will experience age-associated comorbidities at least at the same rate as people without HIV, and very likely at an even higher rate. These data displayed here are from the U.S. in the 2000s. Almost 30% of people with HIV had one age-associated condition marked in the black bars. Over the course of the decade, you can see an increase in the yellow, blue, and red, denoting the accumulation of two, three, and four or more age-associated conditions, respectively. By 2009, more than 50% of the people with HIV in care had one or more age-associated condition, and more than 20% had two or more. This burden of multimorbidity is expected to rise still further in the coming years. So it's essential that we consider how HIV coexists with a wide range of other health-related issues, both to proactively generate solutions to the impact of age-associated multimorbidity and to break down the additional synergistic stressors associated with the syndemics that we know are affecting vulnerable populations. TB deaths have not declined as steeply as deaths due to HIV AIDS. In this figure from the WHO, HIV deaths in red have declined since the mid-2000s, while TB deaths in both people with and without HIV, in orange and yellow respectively, have stayed relatively flat over the past two decades. As we have learned from the HIV epidemic, a rigorous study of the care cascade can focus efforts on high-yield opportunities to improve engagement in care, and this includes improving our understanding of the structural barriers to care and how they contribute to syndemics. So let's look at an example of the TB care cascade. This one is from India. The orange bar on the far left represents all estimated prevalent TB cases. Only 60% of these cases were diagnosed, only 53% initiated treatment, and only 45% completed that treatment. We need to improve TB diagnostics, access to care, and completion of drug therapy once it's initiated. 
And syndemic risk factors such as poverty, incarceration, marginal housing, and others play an essential role in the TB epidemic that must be countered. Hepatitis B and C are also well described both as independent epidemics and coupled with HIV co-infection. In these WHO data of deaths from 2000 to 2015, HIV deaths in red declined, TB deaths in yellow were mostly flat, but hepatitis deaths in black steadily increased. With available and effective antiviral treatments for both hepatitis B and now hepatitis C, we must change the trajectory of hepatitis outcomes. As the HIV AIDS community, we're used to thinking about TB and the hepatitides that are so frequently co-infections with HIV. Structural barriers that contribute to infection and reduced access to testing and treatment often overlap. But I want to talk about other common causes of death in order to highlight where there are synergies between HIV AIDS and other health-related issues. These are the most common causes of death globally in 2016. Highlighted in blue are ischemic heart disease and stroke, the top two causes of death. It's easy to dismiss these as problems of high-income countries, and they are, but they are also the top two causes of death in upper-middle-income countries on the top right and lower-middle-income countries on the bottom left. And even in low, there they are, and even in low-income countries, ischemic heart disease and stroke are in the top five causes of death, number three and number five, respectively. We can assess opportunities to improve overall health by considering the underlying contributors for common causes of death and disability. This figure, from a recent review of the impact of climate change and pollution, highlights that millions of deaths occur annually due to pollution, the tallest bar on the left in blue. Pollution also contributes to far more deaths globally than any of the other risk factors that are also incredibly important. Solutions to the problems of pollution and climate change and its grave impact on human health are needed, especially as these most frequently affect populations who are already vulnerable due to poverty. Like pollution, tobacco use is a major risk factor for multiple comorbidities and indeed is the second most common attributable risk factor in this same study, highlighted now in blue, second from the left. Tobacco use is a major modifiable risk factor for morbidity and mortality worldwide. Tobacco use leads to an increased risk of TB, many types of cancer, COPD, cardiovascular disease or CVD, and stroke. Because tobacco use increases the risks of these comorbidities, it's a prime example of a risk factor within a syndemics framework. In 2015, 6.4 million deaths, or 11.5% of all estimated deaths in that year, were attributable to smoking. And in Asia alone, 2 million deaths were estimated to occur among adults 45 years or older that could be attributed to smoking in 2014 alone. That's 19.1% of all deaths in Asia that year. And tobacco use is a major driver of mortality in people with HIV. In the U.S., up to 40% of people with HIV are also smokers. And these data presented here are from a modeling analysis led by my colleague Krishna Reddy at Mass General Hospital. Using a simulation model, CPAC US, Krishna and his team projected the life expectancy for people with HIV who were never smokers and initiated ART at age 40. Dr. Reddy estimated a life expectancy of 71.9 years for these never smokers in light blue on the left. For people with HIV who quit smoking when they started ART and entered care at age 40, life expectancy was reduced by just one year. This is the middle blue column in the center. However, among people with HIV who continued to smoke, life expectancy was markedly decreased to just 65.2 years, a loss of 6.7 years indicated by the dark blue column on the right. Smoking is killing people, both with and without HIV. Tobacco use contributes to cancer, and cancer rates are on the rise worldwide. Recent data suggest that there are 28% more cancer cases in 2016 when compared to estimates from 2006. You'll notice in this map of incident cancer cases published earlier this year that there's far too much orange and red, 
all colors that denote a rise in cancer incidence since 2006. And outcomes of cancer are extremely mixed. This map shows countries in blue that have had a reduction in cancer deaths since 2006, and in orange or red if there's been an increase. It's striking how much of the world is not blue. Access to proven chemotherapies and other modalities of cancer care remain a challenge worldwide and are another structural barrier to care. The global fight for HIV AIDS has long included an important emphasis on access to ART and harnessing the power of advocacy will be invaluable. Diabetes prevalence worldwide is also rising. This figure adapted from the NCV risk factor collaboration shows that the rise in diabetes is predominantly due to new cases in Africa and the Middle East in pink at the top, in Asia in orange, and in Central and South America in green. And although there are more cases of diabetes worldwide, many people don't know of their status. In this study of the general population in South Africa, only 55% of diabetics had ever been screened and only 40% knew of their diagnosis. In this study, most people who were diagnosed with diabetes were actually started on treatment, but only 19% of the whole population overall had achieved good glycemic control in the far right. Again, qualitative and quantitative assessment of cascades of care can help to ascertain where structural barriers exist and how we can consider innovative solutions. Suboptimal diagnosis Suboptimal linkage to care and poor glycemic control is a problem in resource-rich settings as well. These data are from the U.S. and reflect data from the NHIS data set nationwide. Even in a research-rich setting, only 40% of people with diabetes were achieving good glycemic control, which is so important for reducing their risk of other diseases as well. In addition to smoking and diabetes, Hypertension is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and stroke. Importantly, hypertension is asymptomatic among the vast majority of people who are eventually diagnosed with it. But over time, hypertension will cause end organ damage, including stroke, kidney disease, cardiovascular disease. And this makes hypertension an important disease for screening and treatment. And hypertension is incredibly common, especially as people grow older. These data here show the estimated scope of the challenge the absolute number of adults currently with hypertension worldwide. These data are from 2010, so maybe not quite currently. Um, there are over uh, 200 million men and 200 million women in East Asia and Pacific alone with hypertension. Although it's a common disease, hypertension often goes unrecognized. In a cohort in Malawi, both urban and rural, only 56% of patients with hypertension had ever been screened and only 42% knew of the diagnosis. Although 29% were prescribed some treatment, only 11% of all people with hypertension had blood pressures that were in control. Hypertension must be considered in this endemics framework as well. As a cardiovascular risk factor, it works synergistically with diabetes, smoking, hyperlipidemia, inflammation, to result in worse long-term outcomes for cardiovascular disease, stroke, kidney disease. To improve prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, we need to consider the structural barriers to care and tackle them. People with HIV, we know, are at elevated risk for cardiovascular disease due to the virus, and they are aging, and risk reduction must be optimized now. It's essential to emphasize the vitally important topic of mental health. Depression and anxiety are highly morbid diseases and have been strongly associated as synergistic with a wide range of other health issues, ranging from heart disease to substance use disorder to HIV. These data are from a primary care settings in the U.S. and reflect a care cascade that is similarly inadequate to those of diabetes and hypertension. Less than half of people with depression who saw their primary care provider were diagnosed, less than a quarter were initiated on treatment, and only 6% achieved control of their depression. Given that depression is so closely associated with loss of follow-up, reduced adherence to antiretrovirals, opportunities to improve the diagnosis and treatment of depression are essential, as well as its remarkable morbidity that's associated. So let's compare some of the care cascades that we've reviewed today. Moving left to right, this graph directly compares the care cascades 
HIV and TB on the left, in red and orange respectively, and non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and depression on the right, in green, blue, and purple. The dramatic drop-off among diagnoses, treatment initiations, and achievement of good control among the non-communicable diseases is striking and marks important opportunities to improve the health of people with and without HIV. Strengthening health systems is essential. Tobacco use, diabetes, hypertension, depression, all have intervenable targets to reduce poor outcomes and improve quality of life. As a model of chronic disease treatment, global HIV care suggests innovations to improve diagnosis, linkage, and treatment, and retention, especially focusing on opportunities to break down structural barriers and reach vulnerable populations. I do want to emphasize access to medications as well. The HIV community has learned a lot about access to medications and certainly has taught me a lot about it. This is definitely an understatement. These data are from the multinational PURE study and demonstrate availability of antihypertensives for people in high income countries on the far left, upper middle income countries, lower middle income countries, and low income countries all the way on the far right. Within these groups of countries, the study team estimated whether people would have access to one, two, three, or four types of antihypertensives in blue, moving from dark to, right, to light. Although access was widespread in high-income countries and upper-middle-income countries, people living in low-middle-income countries or low-income countries had limited access to antihypertensives. And this is particularly important because it's not at all uncommon for people with hypertension to require more than one medication to achieve blood pressure control. Medications need to be not only available, but also affordable. In this same study, the authors considered medications to be affordable if their costs were less than 20% of a household's capacity to pay. They found that 17% of households in low-income countries could not afford even one antihypertensive medication. And combination medication therapy for metabolic syndrome, meaning two antihypertensives, metformin for diabetes, and a statin for high cholesterol or other cardiovascular risk, were cost prohibitive for 80% of households. In these final few minutes of my talk, I want to return to the concept of syndemics to show how this framework suggests opportunities to maximize impact. As seems intuitive, syndemics worsen health outcomes. Recent studies have demonstrated that an increase in the number of syndemic risk factors has been associated with worse clinical outcomes. I would invite you to consider can we use the syndemics framework to generate innovative solutions that leverage these synergies? Let's return to our example from the beginning of my talk and consider the idea of cash transfers, either conditional or unconditional, in a fairly simplistic manner, but one that I hope can illustrate the potential of such an approach. An intervention such as cash transfers can help to reduce economic instability and food insecurity. And as we know from the literature on cash transfers in HIV, TB, and others, these reductions in economic instability and food insecurity can prevent new cases. For people who already have HIV, diabetes, and or TB, there's also a greater likelihood that they'll stay in treatment. And because of the synergies between each of these three diseases, improvement in each one further improves the health that is achieved with the others, which is so vitally important. Let's continue turning ideas and theories into reality on the ground. The syndemics framework is a theoretical structure to consider real life challenges, but it requires ongoing research and outreach to understand these synergies better, as many in this room are already doing. We need qualitative assessments to ascertain needs and barriers from patients and communities. In this talk, I focused on poverty as a major structural barrier, but it's absolutely essential to take on equally important issues such as discrimination, substance use disorder, violence, sexual minority stress, racism, and others. We need, measure we need measurements of outcomes, yet, yes, in TB and HIV, but also in other health outcomes causing morbidity and death. And we need innovative healthcare delivery for scale up and sustainability that targets syndemics and capitalizes on where there are synergies. In conclusion, HIV is one among many major health issues. People with HIV face multimorbidities that are intertwined with the health for all. Innovative approaches from HIV are essential for other communicable and non communicable diseases, and syndemics highlight opportunities 
to address underlying needs by targeting high impact strategies and synergies. Thank you. To introduce our next plenary speaker, please welcome back Professor Francoise Barry-Sunussi. It's a, a real great pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Peter Piat. Peter, indeed, uh, all of you know him, so he, do not, he, he does not need any introduction. I will just say a few words. I think we know each other since the mid-80s uh, in a meeting in Central African Republic, the WHO meeting for the definition of AIDS in Africa. Uh, so Peter is uh, involved in the field of HIV AIDS since the very, very beginning. But uh, uh, Peter uh, is a clinician, a microbiologist by training. He co-discovered the Ebola virus in, uh, in the year, in 1976, and subsequently uh, led the pioneering research on HIV AIDS, women health and infectious disease in Africa. He has held academic position at the Institute of uh, Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, the University of Nairobi, the University of Washington, Seattle, uh, the Imperial College in London, the College of the France in Paris. He was a senior fellow at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is a member of the UK, uh, um, of the US National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Medicine of France, the Royal Academy of Medicine of his native Belgium, and the fellow of the UK Academy of Medical Science and the Royal uh, College of Physicians. Today, Peter is uh, the director of uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the ENDA Professor of Global Health. He was the founding executive director of UNAIDS and under the Secretary General of the United Nations from 1995 to uh, 2008. Peter has been the IAS president uh, in, in the past, in the early uh, 90s, and I'm very, very, very pleased uh, to uh, ask him to make his uh, presentation on global health and the HIV response. Peter? Thank you very much, uh, Francoise, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm actually speaking on behalf of more than 45 uh, people. That's easier than having all of us here in the, the scene. So this is the uh, report that everybody uh, got in your uh, conference bag. And this is a uh, IES uh, Lancet Commission, really aimed to not only to take stock, but also look into the future. Uh, it's a cliche, but as always, we are at some turning point. And it's a lot about bridges, which is emerging as a uh, theme here in, uh, in, in Amsterdam. Um, before going over the uh, key messages of the Commission, um, let's uh, stand still for a minute that uh, 26 years ago we were here in, um, in Amsterdam, and we were here, and not in Boston, which was the original plan, um, because of travel restrictions for people living with HIV who could not always entered the United States. And uh, so these travel restrictions have been lifted on Presidents Bush and Obama. And, um, but today politics are as present as, uh, as ever and are absolutely crucial for the uh, future of the epidemic. It was also the uh, founding um, conference for, the, for ICW+, um, and uh, I was one of the moving moments of the opening ceremony when the uh, survivors of I, the founders of ICW plus were here from over 40 people um, you know 14 I think uh, are still with us and uh, so these were incredibly difficult times we tend to forget when there was absolutely no antiretroviral therapy and um, it was a, the, the, 
the year that Freddie Mercury died and we all cried in the closing ceremony to commemorate him. But it's this kind of uh, activism that really made a difference. But it was also the first time that Jonathan Mann said, we need to uh, see uh, AIDS in a, a much wider uh, context. And this is where we are uh, today. Now, the first message of our uh, commission is that we are not on track to end the HIV epidemic. We've made enormous progress, no doubt about that. But we also feel and are afraid that the discourse on ending AIDS has bred a dangerous complacency. And when you look at the uh, really very well documented miles to go uh, UNAIDS report, um, the, the facts are there. Also, some great uh, coverage by John Cohen in, uh, in Science. Um, and the, um, it's nowhere better illustrated that um, we're living in, in a world where progress on, on HIV is very patchy, some great stories, and um, looking ahead, in two years' time, we um, will be meeting in um, the Bay Area, in Oakland and San Francisco, and uh, you know that these are two worlds apart, and you can see each other across the bridge um, with great, great uh, impact of, um, you know, very intensive efforts in San Francisco, with a huge decline in incidence of uh, HIV um, in, in gay men and others, and then at, across the bay in Alameda County, where Oakland is, um, a real epidemic um, that's still increasing and is affecting mostly um, African-American um, men and also women. Um, so this is the reality that we have to deal with, and we can't just blame it on people, as I feel we do it. This is about not always uh, considering enough uh, the context. It's been uh, said over and over again, but just I think it's useful to repeat it, that the epidemic is out of control in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, with infections going up, even mortality going up slightly. And what's even more upsetting, in a sense, for me, is that in this age of ART, uh, that uh, age-related deaths are up by 11% in the Middle East and North, uh, America, and North uh, Africa. Sorry, this is really, there's no excuse for that. Second message is that um, whereas we've made enormous progress, the existing HIV tools and strategies are insufficient to actually end the epidemic. And an important article a few months ago, I think, was in, in, in Science, um, drew attention to the fact to a new situation, and that is that um, we've moved from a, an epidemic, an emerging disease, HIV was new, to an endemic situation, sometimes hyperendemic situation. And at the current pace of close to one million deaths, in the 2030s, we'll have as many people who have, will have died from AIDS and HIV as from the Spanish flu, and I mention that because this is the 100th uh, anniversary of the, the Spanish flu, which is the biggest epidemic in modern times. And we should really, you know, put in the dustbin of history all the magic bullet solutions and the single solutions. It's simply not going to work. Great, great progress on 1990-90, and that uh, there's no doubt that uh, treatment as prevention works. Um, but it's also clear that um, we sometimes forget that 1990-90 means actually 1981-73. It's not my mobile phone, but it's this is uh, 90, it's 73, and that it's the 73 that really is going to be uh, be key. And the way I see it is that what really is going to matter, and where the future of the epidemic is going to be determined, and that's 10-10-10, 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 and that's because. You know, we're often um, dry, driven by the fact that um, our resources, that we are there not where the epidemic is, but we're there where, we can, where it's easiest to meet the targets, and um, even if, um, you know, and where the money is, which I understand, but that's not going to stop the epidemic. This 10-10-10, these are the people who, for whatever reasons, um, we can't reach uh, who are, have to be underground and so on and uh, would be this is where the uh, transmission is where people dying still. 
So this is where we should also concentrate on, and um, again, from the UNH report, um, showing how so-called key populations, how at much, much higher risk they are of infection, as you can see in the, in the balloons there. Um, and one group that uh, is very diverse, but is increasingly important, are, um, and it's people who are on the move, mobility, for whatever reasons. Here in Europe, we talk a lot about refugees and migrants. Uh, they're all over the world. They've always been there in, um, you know, in history. But when you look at it, the number of people living in a country other than the one in which they were born is larger than the population of all but four of the largest countries. And so mobility is one of the, the reasons that sometimes when we have population-based um, uh, programs, sorry, um, that um, we don't always reach everybody. And we need to design strategies to, to deal with that. But the good news is that it is possible um, for um, in, in, the, in, in function of the context. Third message is that um, we need a long-term view. We need to really come to terms with the, with the fact that tens of millions of people will require access to ART for, for decades. Decades. Um, so um, this is not going to stop in 2030. Oh. And the um, second part of that longer-term view is that we are at the risk of a resurgence of HIV for several reasons. And one of the reasons is that um, you know, after Asia went through a bulge of young people, of adolescents, Sub-Saharan Africa is now going to enter a, uh, an age where more people than ever, young people, will enter adolescence and young adulthood, um, and, and that in itself is going to uh, be an unprecedented challenge. There can be dividends, as we've seen in Asia. And, um, but adolescents are not only trouble, um, adolescents are agents for change. Young people will change and tell us where to go. And also, the good news is that we can do something about it. Because adolescents now not only are at higher risk, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly girls, but also uh, are often the ones who are not being um, benefiting enough from, from uh, care and treatment. Um, but this is one trial in Zimbabwe, the Zini trial from Rashida Ferrandan workers, and they showed that if you really go to the community, if you use other, you know, community health workers, you can really make a difference, and adolescents then are doing as well as uh, their elder colleagues. Taking the long-term view, this is from um, a report that's now perhaps uh, nearly 10 years old, age 2031, but things haven't changed. And that is that the um, resources that will be needed to continue to treat people with HIV, to deal with the uh, epidemic, even if drug prices and treatment prices may come down, but we have comorbidities which are going to cost a lot of money um, that some of the poorest countries, take Zambia for example, will have to devote more than 3% of their GDP per year uh, on dealing with AIDS and AIDS treatment. That means that international solidarity, international support and funding will be necessary for decades to come. Domestic, dom domestic funding must and can increase, and certainly in middle-income countries where the issue is not often is not the money, but it's policy. But for the poorest countries, we will need for a long time, we will need the global fund, we will need uh, PEPFAR. Uh, that's the reality. Let's not fool ourselves. Fourth message is that um, if the uh, pandemic rebounds, it will have uh, not only uh, a dramatic impact on people living with HIV and on the uh, HIV response, but also um, will most likely diminish support for global health efforts. Let's not forget that it's the AIDS movement, the AIDS response that really gave rise to uh, to the global health movement. The word global health didn't even exist in the uh, in last century. And um, so this will affect then uh, other efforts of, uh, in, in global health. And of course, you know, uh, we've been there before. Um, first of all, um, it's not uh, rocket science, you get what you pay for. But also, 
when the funding stops, and this happened uh, with malaria, when there was a malaria elimination program in the 50s and 60s, and suddenly um, they said, okay, we're there, we're fine, we've made it. And what happened, you can see here in uh, country after country, when the program ends, when the funding stops, malaria rebounded. And that's what will happen with HIV. Again, not rocket science, and millions of people will die. HIV funding is under threat. It's under threat um, partly because of complacency um, in general, but also uh, partly because of politics and so on. And here you can see from various sources, from uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and also from UNAIDS that actually um, development assistance for HIV is going down. And the U.S. has been the leader in um, dealing with HIV, uh, in, certainly in terms of funding and besides the science. Um, and this is so crucial that that um, funding continues, but with growing inward politics uh, poli and uh, inward looking politics with uh, nationalism that we, it's not only happening in the US government, but also in, in the UK, in, uh, in several European countries, we are really at high risk. And it, it's not only the quantity of the funding, but also the quality that matters. Where is the money going? What are the conditionalities? We've, had, uh, we've been there before with the global gag rule. But in the, under the Bush administration, PEPFAR was exempted, basically, and AIDS programs were not so affected. Today, that's a different world. And people on the ground have to make choices now. Will they let women, you know, be suffering from the fact that they can you not know, even talk about uh, abortion and other reproductive rights, or do they have to deal with HIV? I'm very grateful to the Netherlands who took the initiative um, of the She Decides initiative, countering the, um, <laughs> the global gag rule, joined by several European countries. That's what we need. That's leadership. Um, fifth message is that, and there are seven, um, is that we need a rejuvenated effort on HIV. It will be essential, and commitment to a ART must be matched by expanding HIV prevention. There is a new coalition for prevention and so on, but we need that, um, um, you know, to balance it, even if we know that um, treatment in itself is part of that, uh, of prevention, but we need also primary prevention. But the sobering reality is that um, funding for prevention is really minimal. You see on the um, left side um, that for a number of countries, again from the UNAIDS report, that the money, the percentage of AIDS funding that goes to prevention is minimal. And on the uh, right side, you see from the uh, Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation how actually this is in kind of the second lowest uh, brown uh, type of uh, uh, curve that um, uh, funding for uh, development assistance for HIV for prevention is actually diminished uh, over the, in the recent times. So that's really um, uh, uh, bad news and has to be reversed. The good news is that today we have so much more powerful analytic da um, tools, data, and uh, yesterday um, Nduko Kilonzo from Kenya uh, really presented what I think is really cutting edge where she is able, and the National AIDS Control, uh, National AIDS Council is able to really tailor to, um, the interventions by county because they have far better data. So we're going from really to precision uh, public health and precision prevention and, and at an even uh, you know, more granular level in KwaZulu-Natal from, uh, from ARI and the Africa Center has shown how uh, the epidemic and, and transmission is happening in really very limited uh, sets, and that's where we can then uh, concentrate our resources. And the same is uh, most probably true for other uh, infections like tuberculosis. Let's not fool ourselves. The end of AIDS will not be possible without a vaccine. And one day it will be there. It will be there. In the meantime, we will do as well as we can but the good news, again, is that there is more in the pipeline today, exciting news in terms of vaccine development that we haven't had for, for many years. So let's continue that effort. Sixth um, message, and here we come into the bridges in the first place, is that 
the HIV response must make common cause with broader global health uh, issues. Uh, we heard it from Emily uh, how important it is. It's not only comorbidity, but also uh, people affected by uh, or population groups by others, um, by other um, infections, particularly also with the looming epidemic of um, non-communicable diseases. Just one word about HIV and TB, because we heard from Emily. Great opportunity in September when there will be a, a high-level meeting um, at the UN General Assembly. Um, I hope it will not be a missed opportunity. My feeling is that so much that what the ask is is just more money. This is an opportunity to reboot, um, you know, TB control and go into the community. Make sure that it's really people-centered and not just expert-centered. Um, the Commission did a lot of work in terms of modeling how um, a more integrated response can offer a really a win-win for both the HIV and non-HIV health outcomes. And it modeled uh, uh, actually five countries, South Africa, Nigeria, Russia, India, and Kenya, for a number of um, uh, issues that I will briefly mention. First of all, and we heard it also from Emily, uh, and that is not a no-brainer, um, we need to make sure that HIV uh, control and efforts and um, dealing with addiction uh, of all kinds uh, really are uh, coming together. And the modeling clearly shows that it will result in a, a major um, reduction. This was modeling done for Omsk and Ekaterinburg in uh, Russia, um, in major decline in new uh, infections, but also major decline in opioid uh, overdoses. Um, Another no-brainer is um, family planning, is um, mother to child, um, um, is a prevention of mother to child transmission and reproductive health, antenatal. Planning. And here again, uh, this is for modeling for Nigeria, it shows that uh, there is a mutual benefit from, um, in terms of family planning, less uh, maternal mortality, um, and better um, HIV uh, um, prevention of HIV transmission from mother to child, which is really uh, absolutely not on track in uh, Nigeria. I was really dismayed by a report of another Lancet Commission on reproductive uh, health. Um, you know, great on uh, family planning, but mentioned HIV maybe twice, and in contrast to our report where we say we need to build bridges and integrate, not one word about that. Um, and then the uh, big epidemic uh, of our times that is looming, uh, besides mental health uh, issues, and that is uh, you know, non-communicable diseases. We devoted a lot of attention to it, and the, um, when you look at the uh, first one thing is that it's extraordinary how much better we are doing in terms of um, access to care, uh, control and treatment uh, in HIV than in when it comes to diabetes and hypertension. This is for South Africa, but it's probably true for many other countries. Diabetes and hypertension have been there forever. There's no excuse. And um, so in that sense, by really joining forces, by better integrating, um, there is going to be a, a major um, uh, impact on uh, not only HIV uh, incidence, but also on better care for people who are um, you know, living with diabetes and hypertension. Another reason besides comorbidity and all the uh, arguments that um, Emily just uh, brilliantly presented uh, is that, you know, resources are going down. And that means that we need, instead of fighting with each other for diminishing resources, we must work together to make the best out of it. And there are some um, Good, there's some good evidence, uh, for example, from some uh, studies by the Strive uh, Project that if you um, co-fund from various sectors, from education and sexual reproductive health, it's a win-win. You can fund not only HIV but also others. Finally, last uh, key message is that we should enter a new era of global health solidarity and focusing on health center, uh, sorry, people-centered health systems. Um, that's not only clinics and to, to deal with all the uh, big issues in, that we're seeing. But we should not just think of universal health coverage and reduce the AIDS effort to clinics, hospitals, and health systems. We need to think outside the health sector. That's one of the big uh, achievements of our, uh, you know, our movement. 
and uh, we'll hear tomorrow a, um, you can see you know, how the entertainment business uh, with sugar uh, from MTV can make a real impact, a measurable impact on people's lives, testing less chlamydian infections and so on. Um, and a major in, and, and very important um, topic that has been highlighted a few times here is that from the structural drivers. And here we are moving from, let's say, epidemiological analysis and saying beating your wife is bad to the fact that we can do something about it. This is preventable. And let, it's this not only for prevention and transmission, but also violence and harmful gender norms undermine 1990. It's also the same as for, for care. So the big message here is violence is preventable. There are a number of very well conducted randomized trials that show that. So there's no excuse not to invest in it, even if the, uh, the and the impact will be not only on HIV, of course, but on many other things uh, to start with, um, you know, a better life for women. And finally, um, what's pretty um, upsetting, to say the least, is that um, one of the big drivers is discrimination, stigma, and particularly related to homosexuality and the homophobic climate index that you see here is still a sobering lecture. And there was last week at, uh, an editorial by the father of uh, gay activism in, uh, uh, in the U.S. by Larry Kramer, and he said the worst is yet to come, again, calling for a new mobilization here. So to conclude, um, the uh, four major recommendations are that, one, that we need to immediately rejuvenate the HIV response, ensure 191990, 90, attention to 101010, 10, 10, primary prevention, vaccine, R&D. Two, deliver on HIV funding commitments. Global Fund and PEPFAR must be funded. And if, as is called by some, we would integrate the whole HIV efforts in universal health coverage, I know what will happen. Millions of people will die. Millions of people will die because those who need services the most often and are very rarely welcome in clinics, in health services. And uh, so we cannot let that happen. Thirdly, we need to carefully and strategically integrate HIV step by step within primary care, global health, and looking at the scale and the pace uh, in function of the context, and as I said, the needs of people most in need of HIV services. Fourth, we need to make common cause with global health to achieve sustainable health for all. The Commission is planning to follow up for another year and um, with an action plan so all comments are welcome. Now, there are certain things that in the AIDS movement that are not negotiable, and that's what we cannot lose. First of all, that what we do is grounded in human rights and commitment to social justice. Secondly, it's the science and galvanization of innovation. We have been really good and sometimes maybe a bit too fast in adopting at a programmatic level uh, innovation in science. Thirdly, services and programs must be resolutely people-centered. Activism, we would not be nowhere without activism and this strong, diverse movement not drop multidisciplinarity and multi-sectoral action. Of course, the funding and the leadership are there, and above all, the passion. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage IAS President-elect Anton Pozniak. Uh, good morning, everybody. As the President-elect of the International AIDS Society, I'm honored to introduce a new tradition to the conference, the Positive Flame. This week, it's precisely 90 years ago that Amsterdam hosted the Olympic Games. It was at, at that edition of the Games that the Olympic Flame was introduced. The Olympic Flame is Amsterdam's lasting contribution to the Games. This inspired the Dutch Association of People Living with HIV, the Dutch AIDS Funds, the City of Amsterdam, and the IS to introduce the positive flame. 
Yesterday, Mayor Halsema of Amsterdam opened the Positive Flame Tour and handed the positive torch to Nobel laureate Dr. Françoise Barry-Sunoussi, who discovered the HIV virus in 1983. The torch was taken through the streets of Amsterdam. I don't know if you can see my tie here to represent that for you today. <laughs> in honor of the worldwide HIV community, altogether 37 torch bearers touched by or living with HIV consecutively carried the flame through the city. The diversity of the torch bearers was enormous and the atmosphere of togetherness was impressive. And at the end of the walk last night, Timothy Brown, the only person in the world who's been cured of HIV, ignited the first positive flame in the world on the stage in the legendary De La Mar Theatre. And today, AIDS 2018 co-chair Peter Rice carries the flame into the global village to ignite it in the conference and to be carried forward for future conferences. Peter, are you with us? I think we can see him there. Too dangerous with the fire. Can't risk it. Yeah. 
North America. No AIDS conference in North America. No AIDS conference in North America. Okay, thank you. Your voice. Your, your, your voice is killing me. Your voice has been heard. Your voice must be heard and has been heard. It will be heard. It is being heard. It won't be heard in San Fran. It will be heard. How can the voices be heard? How dare you? When they tell me the alone. It wouldn't work. Oh, hey, don't. You can't get there. No. Here's the stick. You don't want to set the place on fire. That's not the Let this be the flame of inclusion and not exclusion. And let it be a beacon of hope for access for everybody, whether it's in San Francisco, Oakland. We can go to the US. We can go to the US. No one's allowed in the US. We heard you, but I think it would be appropriate if you let me say a few words. I wanted to say, regardless of where the conference goes or not, I view this flame, I view this flame as a beacon of hope. And I know it's not easy, but I think it should be a beacon of hope. Ladies and gentlemen, to join Anton Pozniak to present the Prize for Excellence in HIV Research Related to Children, please welcome to the stage Professor Lorraine Scher. And with that beacon of hope, we have to remind ourselves that since 2000, Nearly 9 million deaths have been averted and 21 million people living with HIV are now receiving treatment. However, HIV is not over in any part of the world and we must persist if we're to avoid our hard-won efforts. While the world has seen dramatic progress in expanding access to antiretroviral treatment, the most vulnerable members of society are still often left behind. Worldwide, only one half of the children who need treatment receives antiretroviral therapy. And despite the advances in scaling up prevention of vertical transmission of HIV, 150,000 more children are newly infected every year. These children need treatment, care and support while they grow up. In addition, millions of children, and the number is growing, are affected by the epidemic without being infected themselves. They live in families and communities that are impacted by HIV in regards to their social and economic capacities. These children also need assistance and guidance while they grow up. Good morning. It's always good to have the children after the sparkling fire. The Coalition for Children Affected by AIDS are absolutely thrilled that the International AIDS Society joins together with us to award this really important prize. Um, we know that there's traction on the first th thousand days. Governments are sitting up and saying, yes, we know that early child development is important. But what about the first thousand weeks? Look at all of our youth. Don't just stop at an arbitrary time point. We are very, very happy that children are not decorating the epidemic anymore, that they're integrated, and that there's good science, good evidence, and good knowledge. So it was great pleasure that we're going to call on um, our two wonderful prize winners. Um, selected amongst excellent, excellent abstracts, a real tough job. Um, can I call uh, the first person, who's Claire Davis from South Africa, who's done wonderful work on uh, the effect of interrupting care on mortality. Claire.
Thank you. We couldn't make our minds up. We couldn't make our minds up, and the first prize is jointly shared um, on a lovely study looking at child labor, looking at HIV and violence in small scale gold mines in Tanzania. And it's again a privilege to ask Ramadan Abzal to come forward for the joint prize. Thank you. To present the Dominique Dormont Prize, please welcome back Professor Francoise Barry Sinoussi. Many of you in, in, in the room never heard, I'm sure, about Dominique Dormont. Dominique Dormont unfortunately died at 55 years old in 2003. Dominique has been involved uh, in uh, pathogenesis of transmissible disease, including HIV, in the very early 1980s. Dominique indeed was the first to treat patients with reverse transcriptase inhibitor before AZT. Before AZT, uh, in the mid-80s, he treated, for example, uh, Rockettson in France uh, with a drug that unfortunately was not working and we had to, work, to, to wait the data with other uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Dominique was a very strong advocate of multidisciplinary science and translational science. Uh, he was so much devoted for science, for the benefit of humankind. In remembrance of uh, Dominique Dormont, uh, we decided to create a Dominique Dormont Association and this association, together with the National Agency of uh, AIDS Research and Viral Hepatitis Research in France, proposed to the IAS uh, to uh, give a Dominique Dormont Prize. This prize is there to support young researchers working on chronic condition in human with a particular focus on the interface between HIV and other chronic disease. The prize highlight researchers who demonstrated originality, rational quality, and a multidisciplinary and integrative approach in the field of HIV and AIDS research as uh, Dominique Dormont was doing by himself. The winner of uh, the uh, AIDS 2018 IAS ANRS Dominique Dormont Prize is Shal Shalena Naidu for the abstract entitled Persistence of Myeloid Cell Associated Inflammation in HIV Infected Children af After Eight Years of Early Initiated Therapy. Please welcome Shalena.
We just uh, heard a few minutes ago how much it was important to include everyone, everyone, the vulnerable and key population, if we want really to uh, make progress to the end of uh, HIV AIDS. And I'm very pleased to see that uh, during this conference there is a new generation uh, of uh, very strong activists. This is uh, introducing quite well the next speaker and the topic of the next speaker who is going to talk about making the treatment cascade work in vulnerable and key population. Uh, this presentation will be given by David Melbranchi, probably a French, a French pronunciation. Uh, he's a David is a board certified internal, internal medicine physician and expert in men's and uh, LGBT health, as well as the prevention and treatment of HIV and sexually transmitted infection. David is an associate professor of medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, and he is an experienced qualitative HIV behavioral prevention researcher who has completed several studies on sexual health among black men and di of diverse sexualities. David has published more than 40 articles in leading medical and public health journals. He is uh, known as a dynamic speaker worldwide and has appeared in documentaries in CNN, ABC News, Primetime, TV One, and Black Entertainment Television for his expertise on HIV in the black community. David served as a member of the President's Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, PACHA, from 2006 to 2008, and as the HIV AIDS Clinical Advisory Advis Expert on WebMD from 2010 to 2012. He also appeared in the video series which promote education on sexual health topic for same gender uh, loving men. In 2015, he published his first book, a memory, uh, an, a memoir about his father entitled Standing on His Shoulder. Please, David. Good morning, IAS delegates. All right. Um, I bring warm greetings from the city of Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States, and my home institution, Morehouse School of Medicine. It is truly an honor speaking with you today, and I want to thank the IAS for inviting me to do this plenary. Before I start, I do want to uh, mention, along with the protest that we just saw, that if people in this audience can make their voices heard, we do know that the policies in the United States will make it inhospitable for folks coming to San Francisco in 2020. So make your voices heard with regards to possibly changing the city to the IAS membership. So again, my topic this morning is making the treatment cascade work in vulnerable and key populations. And many of you may be saying, what is my perspective here? What is my angle? So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in upstate New York, the second of two children from the union of a Haitian immigrant and a second generation woman of Ukrainian descent. Like many biracial kids in the United States, I first realized I was black when I was called the N-word at the tender age of six. I'm also a same gender loving man, knowing and embracing my attraction to other men since I was a teenager. I'm an internal medicine physician an HIV physician, a public health official, a writer, and I consider myself very much an activist. I've watched many friends and colleagues become HIV positive over the years, and even seen some of them succumb to the disease. I've worked in the HIV field for almost 20 years now, long enough to experience my own status go from HIV negative to HIV positive in 2007. My first research study was conducted in 1999, exploring the healthcare experiences of black MSM in New York. 
and was based on hearing a man at the time who was struggling with substance abuse describe him thinking his HIV medication, specifically AZT, was nuclear radiation that he was putting in his body. But he continued to take it because he knew it was his best chance to survive. So as you can imagine, my connection to HIV has been both professional and personal over the past few years. Since we are discussing vulnerable populations, I decided to look into what exactly the word vulnerable means. And according to Webster's Dictionary, vulnerable can mean three things. One, capable of or of susceptible to being wounded or hurt. Two, open to moral attack, criticism, or temptation. Or three, when we're speaking about a place open to assault or difficult to defend. When you Google image the word vulnerable, you get images that look like this. And I'm not going to explain them, but while I was doing Google images, I decided to have a good time with it and Google image the word idiot. But back to our regularly scheduled program. But what exactly does vulnerable mean when it comes to populations accessing the HIV treatment cascade? In the United States, it usually means black and brown people, particularly men who have sex with men and all other sexual minorities, as well as cis and transgender women. Vulnerable also includes incarcerated persons, substance users, sex workers, and the impoverished and homeless. Oftentimes, vulnerability equals blackness in our country, mirroring all definitions of the word that I described to you earlier. This morning, I'm going to speak to you unapologetically as a black, same gender loving man and discuss the HIV treatment cascade as it pertains to black MSM in the United States. HIV rates in some areas of the United States rival those of countries around the globe, particularly within black communities. And you can see from this slide in cities like New Orleans, Washington, D.C., and New York City, the rates are not only high, but when you look at subsets in black communities, they're astronomical. Specifically, when we talk about estimated incidences among black MSM, about a third of the new cases in the United States are among black MSM, even though we represent only about 0.5% of the general population. And it's often estimated, this is a stat and slide that's shown uh, many times in the media, that we have a one in two lifetime estimated risk of acquiring HIV in the United States. The global community frequently assumes that because we spearheaded PEPFAR, the United States is doing an admirable job with handling our domestic HIV epidemic. I can assure you that we have much work to do at home. This is a figure of the HIV treatment cascade. You've heard all this week that the ultimate goal is viral suppression. Viral suppression means improved personal health outcomes and also significantly reduces the risk of people living with HIV transmitting the virus to their sexual partners, leading to the current slogan, U equals U. The goals outlined by UN AIDS are 90-90-90. 90% know their status, 90% of those knowing their status are engaged in care, and 90% of those engaged in care are virally suppressed. Recent data from 16 communities in rural Kenya and Uganda suggests that 90% viral suppression is actually a goal that can be achieved. Yet most communities don't reach 90% viral suppression. So where are we losing patients? This figure is from a 2014 modeling study of the treatment cascade among MSM in the United States. Drop-offs are steeper for black MSM than white MSM along each step of the cascade, but both groups experiencing significant drop-offs after being linked to care. This pattern of linkage to care followed by low engagement and low viral suppression happens in various countries, cities, and populations across the globe. It's not strictly a black MSM in the United States thing. So how do we explain this? How do we explain this drop-off in the treatment cascade specifically for black MSM? There's a lot of uh, factors and things that people are considering. Some of those postulated include lack of access to testing and care, lack of insurance, poor social identity formation, meaning racial and or sexual identity formation, poverty, lack of social capital, food and housing insecurity, among many, many others. Global experts point to HIV stigma as a primary contributor to difficulties navigating the treatment cascade. HIV stigma can come from families, friends, places of employment, communities, general society. And when HIV stigma becomes internalized, it may adversely influence testing behavior, disclosure to sexual partners and loved ones, and finally, how one accesses medical care. P. 
People will consciously choose to live in a trance-like denial of HIV, whether positive or negative, when so many of the social messages around them are about HIV are negative or judgmental. HIV criminalization policies contribute to this stigma, ranging from felony charges to, in some countries, persecution and death. This is a figure from the Center of, law, of HIV Law and Policy demonstrating how 30 states in the U.S. have HIV-specific criminal laws, and the southeastern United States, where I am residing and where I work, boasts the most HIV criminalization laws and the highest number of prosecutions. Not coincidentally, this is also the area of our country with the highest HIV rates. Globally, you can see how HIV criminalization laws also impact populations in South America, Africa, Europe, Russia, and China. These laws don't encourage people living with HIV to disclose their status. They shame people into not testing, not disclosing, and not seeking care, and present a stark obstacle to what we are trying to do within the treatment cascade. But it's not just criminalization that's plaguing as far as HIV. It's not just HIV criminalization that's plaguing us. Globally, we know that 74 countries currently criminalize same-sex behavior. This includes 33 African countries, 9 Caribbean countries, and 13 states in the United States of America. This matters because the odds of HIV infection among black MSM relative to general populations are actually two times higher in African and Caribbean countries that criminalize same-sex behavior than for those living in countries in which same-sex behavior is not criminalized. For my straight colleagues and friends in the audience, I want you to close your eyes and imagine a world where you are being criminalized because of who naturally you love. So your husbands, your wives, your boyfriends, your girlfriends, your other sexual partners, imagine your country saying it's a crime for you to naturally love who you love, and you can imagine how messed up this situation is for us. With this, <laughs> with this information, we have to ask ourselves, however, does stigma begin and end with HIV or same-sex desire for black MSM? What about the intersecting stigma of racism, which we often don't like to talk about? What about the scourge of white supremacy and colonialization that has been a global epidemic for portions for centuries? What about anti-blackness? Does the trauma of racism, implicit bias, and associated microaggressions influence how black MSM navigate the treatment cascade? Do the power dynamics of white supremacy get in the way of optimal patient care in the, in the treatment cascade? Truth is, we don't know the answers to these questions because we have yet to study them. But believe me that they exist every single day, as those of you in this room know. Instead of just investigating HIV stigmas in communities, future studies must examine how intersecting stigmas based on race, gender, sexual orientation, immigrant status, class, and gender identity influence patients' engagements in the treatment cascade once they are linked to care. Another problem is that most studies addressing the treatment cascade in black MSM seem to focus on individual level variables, societal systems, and cultural barriers to testing and care. While these are all obviously important considerations, if the major drop-offs we see in the cascade happen after black MSM and other populations are linked to care, why don't more studies explore what is happening within medical settings? Instead of simply measuring what external and personal variables influence how consistently patients keep their appointments, why aren't we studying what they are experiencing in our clinics as a means to identify clinic-level facilitators and barriers to engagement, ART use, and viral suppression? I'll put out there that maybe, as medical and research communities, we're afraid to conduct needs assessments and evaluations of our own systems, policies, paperwork, and personnel. Maybe we're scared of what we're going to see when we look in the mirror. Maybe it's easy to get caught up in the shine of scientific advancements, so much so that we lose sight of the larger social picture. Maybe it's easier to just congratulate ourselves on our efforts while we sip expensive wine in hotels at international conferences. Maybe we are so invested in our savior complexes that we refuse to consider that the power differential between medical systems and vulnerable communities may be partly responsible for why viral suppression rates are so low right now. If you look at this image globally, you can see from studies that we've 
that have been put out there in the research, HIV-related discrimination in healthcare settings has been documented in China, the Caribbean, Latin America, but they all remain relatively unexplored. In Nigeria and Swaziland, fear of discrimination based on sexuality and or HIV status in healthcare settings deters MSM for ac from accessing services, disclosing sexual behavior, and taking ART. Clinical providers in Kenya have expressed discomfort when providing sexual counseling to MSM. And in the United States, non-white patients receive ART less and achieve viral suppression less than their white counterparts. Differences in healthcare providers' communication styles with patients based on race influences their conversations also regarding ART adherence. And despite some of these findings that I've shown in this slide, studies of medical systems like these are few and far between when discussing the treatment cascade. Even fewer studies examine the way variables such as clinic flow, atmosphere, staff attitudes, clinic stigma, or bureaucratic paperwork impacts patient experiences. What I'm suggesting to you this morning is that HIV testing and linkage to care is critical, but how to keep people engaged in care is the next challenge facing us. The answers are part social context, part individual level behavior, but definitely part the responsibility of medical systems and personnel who are delivering these services. This is Gordon Ramsay. Why am I putting Gordon Ramsay on a treatment cascade slide, you're wondering? I want you to imagine, a, um, I'm going to create a, an image for you here. Imagine a restaurant opens up in your city where 100 people come once, eat a meal, but then two months later, only 40 of them return to eat another meal. Would the restaurant sit back and conduct a study to figure out what's wrong with the consumers that they won't continue to patronize their establishment? You all know the answer to that, they wouldn't. The leadership would take a look at themselves. They would ask questions. Does the food taste good? Does it need more seasoning? Did Karen put raisins in the potato salad? <laughs> are the ingredients fresh? Where is the location of the store? How are we advertising to the community? Is it convenient to our consumers? And how about customer service? Are our staff friendly and courteous enough? Are they treating the customers with dignity and respect? That's what a good company would do if they were truly trying to provide a service to the community. <laughs> Unfortunately, most research on black MSM and the treatment cascade ponders what's wrong with the vulnerable community first and looks at the medical community much later, if at all. Stigmatizing phrases such as they are hard to reach, don't trust doctors, or uneducated, or are far too common, and absolve medical systems from holding themselves accountable for not just access, but the quality of health services we provide. Maybe we should be asking questions like, what are the community's priorities? Are we actually the right ones to provide clinical services? Is the paperwork for funding too much for staff to stay on top of? Is the certification process to engage in the clinic so cumbersome that it deters patients from completing it? Is our location or clinic name stigmatizing so much that people don't want to come? Or have we trained our staff in cultural humility so they don't make patients feel more stigmatized than they already are? Simply blaming the victim never gets us far in public health, but yet, that, yet that, that's exactly what we seem to be doing when it comes to vulnerable communities and the HIV treatment cascade. So as I stand in front of you, today is July 6, or July 26, I'm sorry, 2018. We have amazing single tablet regimens with minimal side effects. We have treatment as prevention and U equals U. We speak of PrEP, both oral and injectable, like it's mana from heaven. Rapid test and treat approaches look promising. Monoclonal and broad neutralizing antibodies are beautiful scientific advances to behold. New approaches to vaccines are garnering excitement for a cure, but unfortunately our social and humanitarian advances lag woefully behind our scientific ones. Medical communities are microcosms of larger society. If societal stigmas and other institutional issues are plaguing us as gatekeepers to these scientific advances, communities won't consistently access these venues and we won't get to zero new infections anytime soon, no matter how much we say it. So what are the solutions? 
You probably heard a lot of the abstracts and presentations at this conference talk about some of these things, and not specifically for black MSM. You have issues of peer navigation, patient reminders, rapid test and treat, mobile medical teams, case manager interventions, focusing on social issues, housing, food, employment, education. We also are proposing looking at general health initiatives and not focusing on HIV and going backwards. And also, as I mentioned earlier, getting rid of anti-LGBT and HIV criminalization policies. But what I want to focus your attention on is the final bullet point in this side, which is talking about homegrown community interventions. If you want to encourage black MSM to get tested, follow the example set by the Black and Minority Ethnic Network and the GMFA, or Gay Men's Health Organization, in the United Kingdom. They actually had the audacity to show loving images of two black men together as a way to encourage knowing one's status. And the tagline it reads, as you can see, I test for me, him, and us, I test for HIV because it looks after both of us. If you want to get black MSM linked to care, make sure to engage community peer navigators as the focal point for connecting people from inpatient to outpatient care as they are doing in Kenya. And if you want to keep black MSM virally suppressed, take notes on the initiative called Thrive SS, started by Daniel Driffin, Larry Scott Walker, and Dwayne Bridges in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> I have to give a shout out because they're actually down here too. Thrive SS is an online community of black men living with HIV that provides community-led support and affirmation, and in a small study has led to viral suppression rates for, of over 90% among about 700 of the group's members. And they do have a, a booth in the Global Village if you want to check them out. So perhaps what it takes to make the treatment cascade truly work is changing our perspective. Yes, communities and people can be vulnerable due to adverse social circumstances and conditions, but maybe public health, medical staff, researchers, and even activists should consider the power dynamics created by some of our spaces, employees, and protocols that may be complicit in perpetuating this vulnerability as well. And that may be the reason why patients fall out of care. But if we don't ask these questions of ourselves, we may never know. And if we don't know, how can we do better? So to my public health and research colleagues and my medical colleagues, you're probably asking, what does making ourselves more vulnerable look like? Or what does it mean? Making yourself vulnerable means looking at ourselves in the mirror and examining how our implicit biases may impact patient care and follow-up. It means not referring to black and or same gender loving people as hard to reach just because you don't know how to reach us. It And again, this goes for a lot of other vulnerable communities. It's not just specific for black MSM. Being vulnerable means um, not treating black people like we are genetically predisposed to be less educated or less adherent with ART. It means making sure you and your staff use the correct pronouns when speaking to our trans and gender nonconforming persons. It means that taking a good sexual history begins with talking about sex as pleasurable, not just a risk behavior for HIV and STIs. And I'd like to put a plug for the CDC. I don't work for them, but I want credit for this. You guys have the five Ps. I want to propose that you include a sixth P, which is pleasure, when you're training providers about how to take a sexual history. But just give me credit. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. It means, it means acknowledging that communities may know more about saving themselves than you do. It means that if you are actually truly committed to eradicating HIV stigma, you will stop using the phrase HIV infected when describing human beings in your speeches, presentations, abstracts, and journal articles. Try embracing terms like living with HIV or HIV positive when referring to your patients or research subjects. It means changing the stigmatizing phrases retained in care to changing it to engaged in care. Retained implies possession as if you are retaining prisoners in custody. The treatment cascade is not a correctional facility. It means giving a little bit of your personal self to your patients so that they can see you as a human being instead of a robot with a white coat. And finally, being vulnerable means treating patients as you would want to be treated if you were the one living with HIV. There's an old Wakandan proverb that I'm going to quote now. 
Just because something works doesn't mean it can't be improved. Yes, some countries and cities are doing a decent job at getting better, uh, at getting people living with HIV identified and into care, but we can do better with viral suppression. The science will never work up to its potential if we don't practice the art of medicine to keep people engaged. Viral suppression is as much our responsibility as it is the communities we serve, and we owe it to them to take a closer look at how we can improve. That's how we make the treatment cascade work in key and vulnerable populations. In closing, I know I've gone on a little bit too long, but I want to speak directly to the same gender-loving men of African descent in the audience. This slide is a collage. <laughs> I thought I wouldn't get emotional. Um, this slide is a, is a collage of black same gender loving men who inspire me nationally and globally. Some work with HIV, some do not. Some are alive, some have transitioned. Some are in this very room. This slide does not include all of those who inspire me, so if I have overlooked you, blame my head and not my heart. I want you to look at these beautiful and brilliant men. We are the gatekeepers and warriors of our families and communities. We are the vibrant fabric that keeps our societies intact and thriving. We are much more than a hard to reach population, walking risk factors for HIV or vectors of tr disease transmission. We are proud black men. We are the educators, policy makers, CEOs, healers, hairstylists, farmers, entertainers, construction workers, lawyers, and businessmen in society. We occupy spaces from the streets in Burkina Faso and Accra, Ghana, to the shores of Belize, Salvador, Bahia, Brazil, and Port-au-Prince, Haiti. We go all the way to the New York neighborhoods, Washington, D.C., as well as Jackson, Mississippi. We are kings. We are fathers and sons, uncles and nephews, grandparents and grandchildren. We are boyfriends, partners, and husbands. We are love. So what does being vulnerable mean for us as black same gender loving men? It means that understanding that black men loving black men is not morally wrong. It means recognizing that same sex desire is not un-African. It means that loving each other is not just a consolation prize when non-black men don't love us. It means knowing that who we are is not by and of itself a risk factor for HIV. It means appreciating that the CDC, the WHO, UNAIDS, and the NIH can't save us. And it means realizing that we can't address HIV before we address our overall physical and mental health. It means embracing the fact that we are the ones we have been waiting for. So let's create a different cascade. One that starts with us embracing the positivity and beauty in our blackness and same-sex desire. A cascade that moves to linkage to families, both biological and non-biological, and friends, ensuring that we stay connected and not isolated and alone. A cascade that encourages consistent engagement with each other and celebrates the physical, emotional, and spiritual intimacy we share with one another. And finally, a cascade that ends not with viral suppression, but with honest sexual expression, so that we feel free to walk this earth in our truth. My brothers, the medical community is not solely responsible for our health. Black men loving black men is the revolutionary act, and being vulnerable is not always a bad thing. Let's love on ourselves and each other as often and as fiercely as we can. That is how we will make a difference in the treatment cascade. Thank you very much. To introduce our final plenary speaker, please welcome back to the stage, Professor Francoise bayes -Moussi. What a wonderful talk. <laughs> we are all also extremely concerned about the situation of the HIV epidemic in uh, Eastern Europe. I'm sure you will all join the next speaker for a call for action. A call for action for living 
no one behind. This is extremely important, so I am very, very pleased to ask uh, Jana to join us. Jana Panfilova is heading the board of uh, teen energy, teen energy a union of adolescents and youth in Ukraine, and she is a member of the steering committee of the global network of young people living with HIV. Yana is a co-author of the report, Key Barriers to HIV Testing for Adolescents in EECA, Ukraine, Russia, and Georgia. Yana was born uh, with HIV, and uh, when I was 10, I discovered my HIV status, she said. At 13, she spoke at the International Children and HIV Conference on behalf of adolescents living with HIV. Um, and uh, she said that as a result of her advocacy and speaking openly about her HIV status, the Ukraine Ministry of Health introduced disabilities benefit for HIV positive children uh, in June 2003. She also spoke at the expanded meeting of the Coordinating Committee of HIV Prevention in the uh, Sverdlovsk uh, re region in Russia in December 2013. Shortly after this, the government took a decision that these structures would pay special attention to your youth living with HIV, which is wonderful. Please, Yana. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. My name is Yana. I was born with HIV, and I'm 20. When I was 16, I founded of Teenagizer, the only movement of adolescents and youth in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, to raise HIV and health awareness. I'm so happy to be here. This is my first international AIDS conference, and trust me, the most important thing in my life now. And you. And you know what? For the first time, I missed my flight on, way, on my way here. <laughs> in an ideal world, this would be happy never happened. But the world we live in, it's not perfect. Look, I like ideals, but I would like to all to take off the pink glasses and look at reality. I will tell you four story that demonstrate how HIV program failed to reach young people. And this tell us how to connect the mistakes we are making. This is Chimney, he is 24 from India. Uh, he was, Chimney was born with HIV. He wrote me, in my country a lot of girls get pregnant around 14 years old. Our government doesn't provide my peers a social education. There are no sex education classes at school. Parents don't talk about it with their children. I was lucky. I got some information from my parents as well as the internet myself. But, but most of my peers don't have any access to information about sexual health. India is a country with a lot of culture taboos. For 10 years, I have been waiting for the day when sexual and reproductive health education is our priority. This is what we need to help adolescents and youth take care of their health and lives. This is my dream tour. Teachers in our country are not prepared to talk about reproductive health with us. They are even less ready to talk about sex and sexuality. Schools don't provide sex education. Governments are not willing to change politics to make sex education available. Our society are often afraid that sex education will lead to prom promiscuity. But we know this is not true. Information is protection. We know how evidence that young people who are informed about sex are more likely to protect sex 
and also more likely to delay started sex. We need political leaders at school system to make sexuality education available now. This is Maluba. Uh, she's 25. Maluba from Canada. She is living with HIV2. With her diagnostic, Maluba has seen many healthcare providers. Maluba wrote me, healthcare providers have never treated me as someone who couldn't take control of my own health. They never truly respect me as patients. It has always seemed that my doctor and my mother are making all decisions about my health without me. I'm just standing there, looking at them in silence. This attitude is still affecting my life. Often I had trouble advocating for what I need and what and want. Now I just want health worker to work with young people as partners in our, our care. In, in this is priority. I do this Maluba myself. In my own case, the doctors felt more comfortable talking my mom, my mom, sorry, my house without my mom, as she know, uh, no, uh, as she know better than me where my body hurts and she knows what to take in pills instead of me. Healthcare system must work with young people. They cannot simply ignore us because we know our body best. We are completed. We are completed, powerful, independent human being. And we need the doctors to trust us. Trust is must. We need to be able to ask any question and know that we will receive clear, honest answer in the friendly way. If you want to make health consultation truly affect us teenager, young people, my peers, we are equal partners in health. The next story. The next story, this is Julian. He is from Lebanon. He is living with HIV as well. He wrote me. I'm Julian. I'm Julian. I'm a young HIV positive gay man who was raped at the age of 10. I grew up as an introvert kid in society that's not only on stigmatized and discrimination against gay men, but also criminalized us. I often face bullying at school, including physical assault. I was, not able, I was not, not able to defend myself or even speak up about it. But the age of 18, I was diagnosed with HIV. This added another layer of stigma and discrimination, not only from the society, but also from the gay community. I was rejecting my own community. I couldn't date any, I couldn't date any gay. I couldn't love or feel loved. Even in the health care, I felt rejected. One healthcare worker told me, you are the age of my children. Thank you, God, they are not like you. I take good care of them. LGBT youth in my regional, including my friends, experience similar problem. Across the world, other young key populations suffer, suffer from stigma as well. While, so, while while feeling rejected, young people tend to take risks such as drug users, drug use, and unsafe, unsafe sex. Ending stigma around HIV requests huge change in society attitudes toward gay men, sex workers, drug users. We must not let anyone feel rejected. Every young person deserves to be treated as respect and dignity. The last story I want to share with you is from someone I know very well. I was born with HIV and learned about my status when I was 10. I have always lived in the capital of Ukraine, Kiev, and when I was a kid, HIV meant AIDS, and AIDS equals death. Imagine for a second, what is what, is what like to find out you are terminally ill? So, I, of course, I ignored every thought about this. The first time I realized I was not alone was when I came to self-support group for HIV-positive adolescents, the only one in Kiev. This 
experience encouraged me to disclose my HIV status to my best friend, the closer person in my life who I love and trust. I remember this evening very well. I'm not a great baby, by the way, but I cried the whole time while telling my story. I couldn't stop. I was carried shitless. I couldn't lose my best friend and world. I, I couldn't lose my best friend. My world would be breaking down. But my friend took it well. That evening helped me understand someone important about myself. I live with HIV, but I'm so much more than just an HIV positive person. This is just one little part of who I am. I decided I had enough be believing that my HIV status is more powerful than me. This This is my story. The self support group I attend helped me making friends who were also HIV positive. However, we grew up without any public support for us. So we had to help each other ourselves. We had to grow up quickly. We stand in building a community of friends where HIV positive and HIV negative were welcome. We started with five people and we stand in building bridges among teenagers and across countries. Now we are hundreds connect across many countries um, across many countries in Eastern Europe, Central Asia. And this is not the beginning. I can make change happen. They can We can use innovation and digital solutions to connect young people living with HIV. We can get them to be engaged as partners in prevention and in care. But we need support from our governments and from many other partners. This is an investment in our present and our collective future. Because we are future today. Yeah. Do you remember the first story I shared with you today? There are many more stories like this and many challenges we need still to address across the world. Sex education, participation in healthcare, young key population investment. And you know why? They are also important because we, the youth, are still in dealing with our issue without any support. We are included in the policy paper, strategic and program. But it's only paper. The paper never leaving the offices, the politicians. We can keep our pin glasses, pretending this is okay, and we love us a decoration, the record, the soul. We can hope this will solve this problem, but it's never real. We must give young people the opportunities to get involved, to participate. The truth is that we adolescent and youth know our problem and needs. We must be partners in solving them and not just decoration. And this is big picture of life. This is what leaving the one behind. It's about a call to action. Thank you. The conference organizers would like to thank all the speakers and co-chairs for their participation. The plenary session is now over. Guys, we wish you all an excellent day here, at please. the AIDS 2018 conference. Uh, I want to tell you about one campaign from Eastern Europe, Central Asia. And I want to talk about Chase the Virus. Chase the Virus, not people. Chase the Virus. Thank you.